Okay, part 10. This week we are focusing on the changes in Lee from the beginning of his story till now, till, you know, past the turning point. Um, and we're going to hear from Mr. Fridley today. So I want you to think carefully about what is Mr. Fridley's role in the changes in Lee? Tuesday, February 6th. Today I felt so tired. I didn't have to try to walk slow on the way to school. I just naturally did. Mr. Fridley had already raised the flags when I got there. The California bear was right side up, so maybe Frid Mr. Fridley didn't need my help after all. I just threw my lunch down on the floor and didn't care if anybody stole any of it. By lunchtime, I was hungry again, and when I found my little cheesecake missing, I was mad all over again. I'm going to get whoever steals my lunch. Then I'll be sorry. I'll really fix him. Or maybe it's a her. Either way, I'm going to get even. I tried to start a story for young writers, and I got as far as the title, which says, Ways to Catch a Lunch Bag Thief. A mousetrap in the bag was all I could think of, and anyway, my title sounded too much like Mr. Henshaw's book. Today during spelling, I got so mad thinking about the lunch bag thief that I asked to be excused to go to the bathroom. As I went out in the hall, I scooped up the lunch bag closest to the door. I was about to drop kick it down the hall when I felt a hand on my shoulder, and there was Mr. Fridley. What do you think you're doing, he asked, and all this time, he wasn't being funny at all. Go ahead and tell the principal, I said, see if I care. Maybe you don't, he said, but I do. That surprised me. Then Mr. Fridley said, I don't want to see a boy like you get into trouble, and that's where you're headed. I don't have any friends in this rotten school. I don't know why I said that. I guess I felt like I had to say something. Who wants to be friends with someone who scowls all the time? Asked Mr. Fridley. So you've got problems. Well, so has everybody else, if you take the trouble to notice. I thought of Dad up in the mountains, chaining up every, his eight heavy wheels in the snow. And I thought of Mom squirting deviled crab into hundreds of little cream puff shells and making billions of tiny sandwiches for gulp, golfers to gulp, and wondering if catering by Katie would be able to pay enough to make the rent. Turning into a mean-eyed lunch kicker won't help anything, said Mr. Fridley. you got to think positively. How, I asked. That's for you to figure out, he said, and gave me a little shove toward my classroom. Nobody noticed me put the lunch bag back on the floor. Wednesday, February 7th. Today after school, I felt so rotten I decided to go for a walk. I wasn't going to eat any special place, just walking. I had started down the street past the paint store and antique shops and bakery and all those places and on past the post office where I came to a sign that said butterfly trees. I had heard a lot about these trees where monarch butterflies fly thousands of miles to spend the winter. I followed arrows until I came to a grove of mossy pine and eucalyptus trees with signs that say quiet. There was a big sign that said warning. $500 fine for molesting butterflies in any way. I had to smile. Who would want to molest a butterfly? The place was so quiet, almost like church, that I tiptoed. The grove was shady, and at first I thought all the signs about butterflies must be some kind of ripoff for tourists because I only saw three or four monarchs flitting around. Then I discovered some of the branches looked strange, as if they were covered with brown little sticks. Then the sun came out from behind a cloud. The sticks began to move, and slowly they opened wings and turned into orange and black butterflies, thousands of them quivering on one tree. Then they began to float off through the trees in sunshine. Here's a picture. I wonder what those butterflies represent. Maybe a metaphor for something? Hmm. Those clouds of butterflies were so beautiful, I felt good all over, and just stood there watching them until the fog began to roll in, and the butterflies came back and turned into brown sticks again. They made me think of a story Mom used to read about Cinderella returning from the ball. I felt so good I ran all the way home, and while I was running, I had an idea for my story. 
I also noticed that some of the shops had metal boxes that said alarm system up near their roof. So does the gas station next door. I wonder what's in those boxes. Thursday, February 8th. Today when I came home from school, I leaned over the fence and yelled at the man who works in the gas station. Hey Chuck, what's in that box that says alarm system on the side of the station? I know his name is Chuck because it says so on his uniform. Batteries, Chuck told me. Batteries and a bell. Batteries are something to think about. I started another story, which I hope will get printed in the Young Writer's Yearbook. I think I will call it The Ten Foot Wax Man. All the boys in my class are writing weird stories full of monsters, lasers, and creatures from outer space. Girls seem to be writing mostly poems and stories about horses. In the middle of working on my story, I had a bright idea. If I took my lunch in a black lunch box, kind of like men carry, and got some batteries, maybe I could rig up a burglar alarm. Hmm. Friday, February 9th. Today I got a letter from Dad, postmarked Albuquerque, New Mexico. At least I thought it was a letter, but I tore it open. I found a $20 bill and a paper napkin. He had written on the napkin. Sorry about Bandit. Here's 20 bucks. Go buy yourself an ice cream cone, Dad. I was so mad I couldn't say anything. Mom read the napkin and said, Your father doesn't mean you should actually buy an ice cream cone. Then why did he write it, I asked. That's his way of trying to say he's really sorry about Bandit. He's just not good at expressing feelings. Mom looked sad and said, Some men aren't, you know. What am I supposed to do with the $20, I asked. Not that we couldn't use it. Keep it, said Mom. It's yours. It will come in handy. When I asked if I had to write and thank Dad, Mom gave me a funny look and said, That's up to you. Tonight I worked hard on my story for young writers about the 10-foot wax man and decided to save the $20 towards a typewriter. When I get to be a real author, I will need a typewriter. February 15th. Dear Mr. Henshaw, I haven't written to you in a long time because I know you are busy, but I need help with a story I'm trying to write for the Young Art, young Writer's Yearbook. I got started, but I don't know how to finish it. My story is about a man 10 feet tall who drives a big truck, the kind my dad drives. The man is made of wax, and every time he crosses the desert, he melts a little. He makes so many trips and melts so much, he finally can't handle the gears or reach the brakes. That's as far as I could get. What should I do now? The boys in my class are writing about monsters. They just bring a new monster on the last page to finish off the villains with a laser. That kind of ending doesn't seem right to me. I don't know why. Please help. Just a postcard will do. Hopefully. Lee Bobs. P.S. Until I started writing, trying to write a story, I wrote in my diary almost every day. Thanks. February 28th. Dear Mr. Henshaw, thank you for answering my letter. I was surprised that you had trouble writing stories when you were my age. I think you are right. Maybe I'm not ready to write a story. I understand what you mean. Character in a story can solve a problem or change in some way. I can see that a wax man who melts until he's a puddle wouldn't I can see that a wax man who melts until he's a puddle wouldn't be there to solve anything or melting isn't the sort of change you mean. I suppose somebody could turn up on the last page and make candles out of him. That would change him all right, but it's not the ending I want. I asked Miss Martinez if I had to write a story for young writers and she said I could write a poem or a description. Your grateful friend, Lee. P.S. I bought a copy of Ways to Amuse a Dog at a Garage Sale. I hope you don't mind. From the Diary of Lee Botts, Volume 2. Hmm. Thursday, March 1st. I'm getting behind in this diary for several reasons, including working on my story and writing to Mr. Henshaw. Really, not just pretend. 
I also had to buy a new notebook because I had filled up the first one. That same day, I bought a beat-up black lunchbox in the thrift shop down the street and started carrying my lunch in it. The kids were surprised, but nobody made fun of me because a black lunchbox isn't the same as one of those square boxes covered in cartoon characters, like the first and second graders carry. A couple of boys asked if it was my dad's. I just, I just grinned and said, Why do you, where do you think I got it? The next day, my little slices of salami rolled up around cream cheese were gone, but I expected that. I'll get that thief yet. I'll make him really sorry he ate all the best things out of my lunch. Next, I went to the library for books on batteries. I took out a couple of easy books on electricity, really easy because I've never really given much thought to batteries. About all I know is when you want to use a flashlight, the battery is usually dead. I fain finally gave up on my story about the 10-foot wax man, which was really pretty dumb anyway. I thought I would write a poem about butterflies for young writers because a poem can be short. But it is hard to think about butterflies and burglar alarms at the same time, so I studied electricity books instead. The books didn't have directions for an alarm in a lunchbox, but I learned enough about batteries and switches and insulated wires, so I think I can figure it out myself. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Lots of changes happening with Lee. That's what we're going to be thinking about and writing about in this section.